participating to this uh, webinar. Uh, before beginning, I would like to pay a tribute to the memory of Denis Kessler, who passed away almost three weeks ago. Without him, we will not be meeting today because he's behind the foundation, which was his uh, baby. Uh, our ba webinars will not take place because he was largely pushing us organizing such uh, uh, webinars. And uh, uh, yes, hi, my name is Julie Novak, and I have uh, an appointment tomorrow for an MRI. I just got a text that said the appointment was at one. Yes, thank you. And uh, uh, he's also behind uh, our interest in quantum modeling. As you know, uh, Denis Kessler was always very curious of all uh, the new technologies and the uh, new scientific discoveries. And uh, uh, his only uh, fears was uh, us uh, lagging behind uh, the innovation. Today, I am pleased and honor to introduce Harold Olivier, a former student of French Ecole Polytechnique, currently a researcher in quantum computing at the Ecole Nationale Supérieure, Normale Supérieure, ENS, and head of the quantum tech program at INRIA, the French National Research Institute for Digital Science and Technology. Harold has worked at the US Department of Energies of the Los Alamos Laboratory, at the Perimeter Institute in Waterloo, in Canada, and at the French Ministry of Economy and Finance at the General Directorate for Enterprise in Paris. He later joined an investment fund in small and medium-sized enterprises before launching a software startup. As you may have understood, Harold has an exceptionally diversified professional career in the new technologies. He is among the best experts on quantum technologies and computing. In his presentation, he will extend the introductory remarks presented last year in June by Pierre Williams. Harold will have a more pragmatical approach and may be bearing in mind that quantum technologies are evolving quickly, update some of the knowledge Pierre Williams shared with us last year. During the rudimentary quantum technologies we have today have already had a profound impact on computer security and on our ability to find solutions to certain types of challenging problems. But to turn these into real and impacting applications, researchers need to develop robust, error-free quantum computers. Quantum computers which exploit the spooky physics of notoriously unstable and easily disruptive subatomic particles remain currently too unstable to perform such sophisticated operations for long. Few last points of attention for our participants. First, don't be surprised, this is a more technical, even if not too technical, as Harold put it in his title webinar. Second, except if a clarification is needed for you, please wait until the end of the presentation of Harold for asking your questions. Third, Harold, you have between 45 and 75 minutes, which leave you uh, time to, to, to choose how much to explain for your presentation that will be followed by 15 to 13, 30 minutes uh, Q&A. Fourth, for all of you at 4.30 p.m., the webinar will be closed. Harold, you have now the floor for helping us perceive what are the main challenges of the quantum technologies and what our young collaborators, especially young actuaries, should be prepared to adapt to in the coming years. Please, Harold, we are expecting uh, your uh, thoughts and presentation and thank you so much for having accepted to share your views with us. Uh, thanks Philippe and I'm uh, really pleased to be here. Uh, we've been uh, uh, knowing each other since a long time but it's the first opportunity we really have to, to talk about quantum information. Um, 
as you have understood, I, I did quantum information for a while uh, when I was younger and then left it and came back. A lot has happened uh, since then. And um, I've also seen that as a challenge, um, as the wider pub public and wider community has been aware of, of quantum information science and its prospective applications, there is also a lot of mis misunderstanding and, and, and sometimes uh, falsehood that are circulated. So I took a risk in this presentation. I took the risk of making it less technical than a scientific presentation, but I would say quite technical uh, uh, for a general audience. But I think it's important that uh, you realize through this presentation that on some aspects, quantum information is not very complicated. The math involved in quantum information, at least for a big part of it, has, has really, are, are really bare bones quantum mechanics, but that there are subtleties. And, and, and that's what is really complicated in this field. So I want to, to go to the point where we, we can actually discuss a little bit of the subtleties so that you are aware when you have a problem and someone tells you, okay, maybe we use some, uh, some quantum computing machines to perform that task. Well, okay, you should get prepared and, and it's not something that you will be using for uh, as a platform, okay? So that's basically the, the summary of the talk. Um, and, and I'll be organizing it in the following way. Uh, so I'll, I'll spend the, 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 the larger chunk of this uh, presentation talking about quantum computing itself. I'll try to be uh, describing then a little bit of the current impact, uh, what has already happened, and maybe what will happen in the future uh, as the last, uh, last step, okay? So let's go right into the, uh, uh, into the, the, the technical talk. Well, if you want to talk about quantum information, quantum processing, quantum computing, you first need to know what is quantum mechanics, okay? So it's going to be a one slide quantum mechanics for us. Um, and first of all, quantum mechanics is a physical theory, okay? A physical theory, that means it's something, actually it's a set of actions, it's mathematics that you use to describe reality. Um, so what does that mean? Well, it means that you, you have some rules some mathematical objects that if you manipulate, then it should coincide with something of their reality. And it's the reality at the microscopic scale. So it's the scale of atoms, electrons, photons, things like this, okay, small particles. Um, and in any physical theory, you find out pretty much the same four types of axioms. So here I'm just stating the axioms, the four axioms for quantum mechanics. So First, it says, what is the system, okay? And how you represent your knowledge about a, a physical system, okay? Sure, it's the sim one of the simplest things that you can imagine. It's just a vector in a complex Hilbert space, okay? So the, uh, Hilbert space is just meaning like it's a vector space. It has additional properties. It's complex, okay, right. But, but you can think about it as really like, uh, uh, you know, uh, a vector in the 2D plane. And it's, it's a normalized vector, which means like it's, it has length one. So in fact, it's, it's even simpler than just a vector. It's just a direction, okay? So it's a direction in a, in, a, in a vector space. And this is everything that there is to know about the system to process it uh, through the theory and, and do what is it, a theory is meant for, which is predicting some, some stuff, okay? But before going to the pre prediction, we need to you know, uh, uh, proceed step by step. And step two, is uh, about saying, okay, I have a small system. And now imagine that I put two small systems next to one another. I need to describe it within my theory, what it means to have two systems. And it just tells you that, okay, if you have these two vectors, you take what is called the tensor product. Uh, so it's, it's a mathematical operation. Again, it's a, it's a small, uh, small, you know, small step. It's not very complicated, but it describes what is the state of two independent systems, okay? So it tells you, you know, you have one particle, one atom. Now imagine that you have two atoms, what, what happens? It tells you how to proceed. Then there is the third system, the third axiom, sorry, uh, which is about evolutions, okay? And evolutions are the simplest thing that you can imagine, okay? It's linear transformation 
over your vector space. Okay, the only thing that you require on top of this is that not only is that a linear transformation, but it's also a reversible transformation. Okay, so if uh, you know linear transformation, it's uh, uh, you know like the, the 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 straight lines that go through the origin is a is a linear function. So linear transformations are the same, but in higher dimension. Okay, so again, it's the simplest one. There, there is no uh, uh, quadratic terms. There is no uh, uh, complicated interactions and things like this. It's all very, very simple. Everything is linear in this, uh, in this story. And it's also reversible, which means that, you know, if you have an evolution that goes forward, you can always revert it and go backward uh, to where you started from. So when you have this kind of linear and reversible transformation, and of course, you know, you want to start from a, 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 an allowed system state and map it to another system state, which means like this kind of transformation must also preserve the length of your vector because you said it's, it's a normalized vector, the, the state of the system. So if you, you know, have these three properties, then it's what is called a unitary transformation. Okay. So, Believe me, this is, you know, the, 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 the simplest thing that you can imagine. This is the nicest properties you can imagine for, for uh, changing uh, a normalized vector in, in, in vector space. So, so, okay, so at axioms one, two, three are quite natural. Now, the um, axiom four is maybe a little bit surprising and it tells you, well, if you want to have a theory that's good to say what is the state of the system, how you combine them, how you evolve, but you also need to, to explain what you can predict uh, with this kind of theory. Okay? And this is, this is what is the content of this fourth action. And the fourth action says, okay, so imagine you're, you are starting in a state which is initially represented by, um, by a vector u, okay? And you start taking this vector u and, and, and your question uh, uh, or what the theory allows you to predict is, well, if I'm trying to measure the content in some sense uh, uh, that I have in this state about another vector v, what, what is the probability of having this? Okay. So what is the probability that if I measure v on my system mu uh, uh, that I get this, this result? And it's simply the scalar product between the two, the two vectors and you square it. Okay. And we'll see that this, this, this axiom is, is actually the trickiest one in the, in, in the pair. Uh, usually you don't have it in, 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 in classical, uh, classical physical theories, or it's, you don't need to say, uh, to say it. Here in quantum, you need to specify what's happening there. Okay, and it just tells you, okay, if you do a measurement of something, of some quantity, or if you ask a question like, is my vector V, uh, uh, well, you get the probabilistic result. Okay? So if you and, and the probability is given by this, this mathematical expression. Again, it's, it's one of the simplest expressions that you can have for vector space. Okay, so basically you have all of quantum mechanics. So now you know quantum computing. Okay. Um, so to be a little bit more explanatory, first, uh, uh, what you should realize is that if you uh, uh, describe the theory in this way, uh, it might sound very physically explanation, but it's actually very, very close to what you would require for actually computing interesting quantities. And why do I say this? Well, because the first axiom tells you how you can put information into physical systems, okay? So you put information into physical systems by changing the, uh, um, uh, the state vector that represents your, your system. Uh, then, okay, that's good. You have one quantum register, uh, or if I say it later on, it's one qubit, okay? But now you want not a single qubit processor, you want to have many of those, so you need to know how to go scaling, okay? And this is the second action. It's given to you by this, uh, this second action. Then, of course, it's nice to be able to store information, but you want actually to process it. And the third action gives you what, what is this process. And now the fourth axiom becomes something maybe a little bit more familiar. Uh, if you do a little, you know, if you do some, some computing, you, you write a program um, and uh, the quantity that you wanted uh, has been computed, it's in some variable. 
but at one point you need to print it, okay? So you need to print it on the screen, on the printer, whatever. You need to, to, to make it accessible to your own uh, uh, sense, okay? And um, this is what this force axiom tells you, okay? It, it tells you, okay, if you have a state uh, of a system, uh, uh, you can extract now some information and uh, uh, it's going to give you this, this extraction of information, but only in a probabilistic way. Okay. Uh, you might complain about this probabilistic way, but uh, I would say this is nature, so you have to deal with it. Okay. So that's basically uh, quantum mechanics seen from a computer scientist perspective. And well, now I want to show you that Already from there, we can have very direct consequences of this action. So first of all, okay, believe me, it works. Uh, or actually, uh, uh, you have proof uh, of it working all the time. Lasers, computers, GPS, they all use quantum mechanics. So it's a very robust and, 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 and good theory uh, that does a lot of stuff, okay? Now, as I said, uh, uh, it's, it, it seems to be good uh, for computing, but maybe there are like two terms that Still, uh, you might be wondering what are the consequences, like the practical consequences. Yeah? I told you like quantum mechanics is linear because these transformations are linear because I'm dealing with vector spaces. So maybe one of, of the questions that you might have is like, well, okay, what does that change if I have this uh, linear, uh, linear quantum mechanics compared to the classical one where I kind of uh, uh, mentioned that, you know, in, in classical physical theories, you can have like more complex interactions, more complex terms with with, uh, with nonlinear uh, uh, non nonlinear terms. Okay, so what is the consequence of this? And uh, uh, this the 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 third uh, element that might be a bit surprising is that I told you that quantum mechanics is reversible. Okay, and obviously this is not the case at, at the macro macroscopic scale. If you break a glass. Uh, you can't just say, okay, I want the glass back. Uh, so rewind what happened and give me the, the glass, but unshatter it. Okay. Uh, this doesn't work, but in quantum theory, it, it does. Okay. In, in, in some, okay. Uh, you, you can, yeah, you can make it work. So now what I want to, 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 to examine is a little bit what could be these consequences of these two uh, specific features of quantum mechanics on, on your ability to compute. And actually, um, it, it's actually making things a little bit more complicated or a little bit more surprising <laughs> um, um, because, well, uh, first of all, if I have linearity, that means that I have superpositions, okay? So I can take, Two states, let's say u0 use, use and u1. Okay, and I, okay, I'm even taking val valid uh, basis states. Okay, and, and uh, well, I can construct two other vectors uh, that I've shown here. I guess you can see my, my, my mouse here. So it's uh, u0 plus u1 over square root 2 and u0 minus u1 over square root 2. And these, these are two perfectly valid states. Okay, so then the question is like, well, okay, what can I do with this? What does it mean to compute? With a superposition, okay. So we'll spend most of the time of the rest of the, of the discussion, uh, the technical discussion, discussing this. Actually. So let me put that aside for a moment and and go to another consequence. Um, if quantum mechanics is linear, you can actually show, and this is a one-line proof of it. Uh, uh, you can you can actually show that you cannot copy information. So copying information would be to say, okay, I'm starting with this, this state here, alpha zero, u zero plus beta u one. Okay, and I would want to have uh, another blank state in my second register and, and, and get to this. Okay, so this is a copy. Okay, I get one state here in my first register and a, a state here in the second register. And this is actually different than, than this second expression. And this second expression is what you would use or what you would get to if you just add linearity to the to the transformation okay so you make the transformation the copy uh u zero you want to copy to u zero tensor product with u zero you uh, want to copy u one so you start from u one u zero and, and then you get u one tensor product with u one and if you extend that by linearity this is what you get and it's different than this one okay so you cannot copy information at least not all the time so that's very weird because 
when we think, you know, in the classical world about information processing, if, if we are just thinking about this, this uh, video conference and, and, you know, giving some information and it's obviously copied to all of you, or I, at least I hope that you get the information, uh, but, but it should, okay? So it works. And, and when we think about information processing, usually we, we have uh, copy incorporated. Okay, so that's that starts being a bit weird. Okay, uh, and and then because all the information is reversible, or all the transformations are are reversible, that means that you also cannot erase information. And that's that's again a little bit disturbing because uh, it's as if you were trying to write a text on a on a text processor, and and you can't you can't uh, you can't erase the text. Okay, so you need to do something else to, to be able to, do, to write your, your letter, okay? So, so these are two very, or three, uh, three very easy and direct consequences of the, of, of the previous sketch, okay? It's elementary calculation. You just write the definition and that, that's it, okay? You get there. So the, 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 the question is, is, well, I told you it looked like quantum mechanics was very good at computing because it, all these actions were clearly following the same actions that you would require for computing something. But at the same time, it has these weird features that you might wonder if, if, if there is still something to compute. Uh, my answer at that point is that don't worry, it works. And I'm going to show you why it works uh, so that you get accustomed a little bit uh, uh, about things that are not weird, not so weird in quantum mechanics so that then we can go to the weird stuff. So let's let's deal about this copy and arrays uh, question. Um, uh, you know that that in classical computing, uh, 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 any function, anything that you can compute, you can always make it as a, 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 um, as a circuit with some gates. And actually, you only need one logic gate to do it. Okay, and this is called the NAND gate. Okay, so I'm going to show you the NAND gate. Maybe it's a little bit small on the screen. Uh, I'm really sorry for this, but I'm going to, to, to describe it. So this NAND gate has two inputs and one output. The two inputs are A and B, so it's two bits, so it could be zero or one. Okay? And what it computes is the following thing. So it takes the product of A and B, and the product of A and B, if you do that with zeros and ones, you realize that A times B is equal to one if and only if A and B are equal to one. Okay, so this is the end part of the NAND gate. So this is this is what this uh, expression is, and then you have a one with a weird plus here. It, it means uh, add one module two. Okay, so if you if you have zero, you'll get one, and if you have one, you'll get two. But two is zero mod two. Okay, so it will flip the value of a times. B. Okay, so that's the not part. So NAND stands for not end. And this is the gate that is universal. So anything that you want to compute with a classical computer, you can always rewrite it. It's not convenient it's, and, and nobody wants to do it, but, but at least as a thought experiment, you can rewrite it with this only single gate. Okay? Now, the problem is this, this gate is not reversible. Okay? And it's not linear if you, if you use it this way. Okay? So let me turn, turn this into a linear gate, uh, sorry, a reversible gate. Okay, so reversible means like if I give you the output, you cannot come back to the to the input. Okay, and of, of course, if I give you uh, just a single bit, which is which would be this this output here, I cannot come back to the, uh, to the value of a and b. Okay, but if it's only going back to the value of a and b, well, you know, it's not a problem. It just just keep the value of a, keep the value of b, compute your stuff. Okay, and if I give you all these three outputs, then of course you can get back to the input because you already have it. Okay. Uh, so this is a reversible NAND gate, and actually, just this is to tell you, oh, okay, um, we have all this classical computing, uh, we can turn it into a reversible classical computing. So it's already closer to quantum mechanics, so we are going one, one way and the other. We are trying to make classical computing, computing looking a little bit more compatible with the quantum theory, and, and we will go also from the, the quantum theory to make it more compatible to the, to the, to the classical computing. Okay, so, okay, fine, we have this gate, we could imagine computing reversibly classically. 
And actually, there is a very nice gate uh, uh, that, that is also used in the, in the classical case. But it happens that you can actually implement this classical gate also with a unitary transformation of, over the vector spaces. Okay? And this, this gate is called the Toffoli gate. And the Toffoli gate is just a, a three input, three output uh, gate. So it has an input A, B, C. You put it into this, this uh, nice representation here. So A stays A, B stays B, and the bottom line is now C plus mod two, A times B, okay? So why is that interesting for us? Well, because if I put C equal to one, then I get A, B, and one mod, uh, uh, plus mod two, A times B. So which means that this gate here, is the same basically as this one, okay? So now I should have convinced you that if I ignore superpositions, um, uh, if I ignore superpositions, then I can mimic the behavior of a reversible NAND gate with a quantum unitary transformation, which is called the Toffel gate. And uh, that means that because the reversible NAND gate is actually universal. In fact, now with quantum mechanics, I can at least do everything that I can do with classical uh, computing. Okay, so that's already one good point for quantum mechanics. It says the intuition that we had at the very beginning. Okay, this is this is obviously a, a physical theory that 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 has been written by computer scientists or something like this. Okay, this theory has four axioms, and these four axioms they, they correspond to what you need for computing. Even though it has this weird cannot copy, cannot erase uh, 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 properties, well, actually, you can do everything that you do with classical uh, computers. Okay, so that's where we are. Now, of course, our interest in, in why we are talking here, and more more importantly, we say why I'm working in, in in this field is that there is a hope that you can do something more. Okay, and this is this something more that we are going to try to to explore. Now. Okay, so. You have noticed that I've put aside uh, the superpositions, uh, but actually, if something, if some power is given uh, uh, extra with, uh, compared to the to the classical computing, it must come from there. Okay, because for the rest, I've been only using my axioms and just mapping the classical uh, into my quantum constraints and show that I can satisfy uh, everything that the classical does with me, with my quantum part, okay? So, so the, the extra power must definitely come from superposition. So let's look at superposition. Um, okay. So let's consider a new gate, which is called the Hadamard gate. Uh, this is this one, but, but let me just jump to the, to the next stuff. This is, you should recognize the, the, the two uh, superpositions that I have considered before. I don't want to consider actually any other superposition uh, in this uh, in this uh, this uh, webinar. We only see these ones. Okay. So and this this transformation is just doing what you expect. So it's taking uh, an input uh, state uh, state vector u zero and it's mapping it into the uh, equal weight superposition u zero plus u one, and u one is mapped to u zero minus u one. So if u0 and u1 are uh, basis vectors and normalized, uh, the other, the, the, this, this vector and, and, and the second one here uh, obtained after applying the gate. So after the transformation, they are again normalized and, and orthogonal. So uh, this is a valid uh, unitary transformation. Everything is fine. So I should be able, like quantum theory tells me, okay, Actually, it tells me a little bit more than what I have, have uh, written before. Like, actually, any unitary transformation, you can implement it. Okay. So I should be able to implement that stuff. OK, good. So this is, this is what I have. Uh, uh, and, and, and then the, the question is like, well, what does it bring more? Good. So now uh, uh, I want to remind you that, that we are dealing again like this quantum mechanics. So we have these axioms. and. It's nice to manipulate and change uh, state vectors, but then you should use this to make a prediction about something. Okay? Making a prediction, my, my fourth axiom is um, actually uh, designing an experiment and asking a question. Okay? So let's ask a question. 
okay? And the question will be the following. Imagine that I start in U0, so I start from this state. I apply my Hadamard gate, so I end up with this one. And then I'm going to ask, uh, is my vector U0 or is my vector U1? Okay, this is a perfectly valid question. Uh, quantum mechanics tells me that uh, you can ask this kind of stuff and the theory will answer by giving you the probability. Okay, of this. Okay, so let's 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 look at this. Uh, so this is this is this this first two expression on the left. Okay, so I start from u zero on the right hand side, and given that I have applied h on u zero, I'm asking like, uh, is the state u zero or is the state u one? Okay. Uh, so you you apply what I told you before. So you take the scalar product, you you square it, and what you find out is that it's one half. Um, you can actually do the, an, another experiment. You start from U1 and you, you ask the same question. And again, it's one half and one half. What it means like is we have constructed this wall theory to just describe a random coin, okay? Uh, so imagine, now I'm, I'm going to, to draw the analogy. So U0 is head, U1 is tail, okay? So I flip the coin, I apply my Adam R transform, and I get 50-50 uh, chance of, of, of being head or tail, no matter what actually I, I start from. Okay, so if I start from head, I have 50% chance of, of ending in uh, head or and 50% uh, percent chance uh, of landing on tail. Okay? And same for the other one. Okay, and this is what these, these four probabilities uh, tell you. Okay. So basically now, um, actually, what happened is that I transformed my computation, which was a perfectly uh, regular, normal, standard, classical computation, and I made this computation probabilistic. Uh, well, that's nice and, and, and good, but this is way not enough to justify anything, okay? Because we know uh, random number generators since a long time, and we can use it classically, and there is no need to go to quantum theory to do this, okay? So, Again, unfortunately, if I stop here, um, quantum theory doesn't add more to, 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 to classical computing. And now will come the, the really weird part. Okay? So imagine that instead of applying the Hadamard gate once, for some reason, you know, let's try it, I'll apply it twice. Okay, and we, we, we do the, the, the calculation together. Um, so it means that you start from U0, you apply H, okay? And you, you land on U0 plus U1. This is just the definition that, that I have here, right? Okay, so nothing tricky here, just apply the definition and, and copy, okay? Now you say, okay, now I want to apply it twice, okay? I want to apply it twice, so you use linearity, which means that you can, you can apply H to this U1 and then H to, uh, H to U0, sorry, and then A, h to u1 take the sum and it's going to be actually the same as if you were applying h to the to the sum itself okay so you can distribute your operation over the, the addition and you do it you do it so this u0 becomes u0 plus u1 and this u1 well re re remind what's what's up there okay this u1 gets transformed into u0 minus u1 okay so you, you have to, to take care of the, of, the, of the square root two factors. They, they multiply with each other to get the one half and you get this expression. And what you can notice is that the U0 term reinforce themselves. I mean, they add up and the U1, they cancel, okay? So in the end, I end up with having U0. Okay, so now, now this is really weird, okay? Imagine that I'm taking the analogy with my, my coin again. So that would mean that I'm starting say on head, I flip it once, I flip it twice, and it's always head, okay? And if I start from tail, actually it's the same. So I start from tail, I flip it once, I flip it twice, and I'm back on tail, okay? So this is not anymore a random number generator, okay? Actually, the, the, the computation that was doing here is perfectly correct but it, it's very misleading, okay? It's very misleading and it's misleading on purpose uh, just to make you realize that, that there is something really weird happening with this uh, very simple single qubit gate. Okay. So you have these superpositions. You might think 
when you look at this computation here, that this is a proposition look like just randomness, but actually they are not. They are not at all random because if I apply this, this, this operation H on something here that maybe given the previous experiment, I would be tempted to interpret as, as a random stuff, but it, I'm getting something deterministic. Well, this does not happen, okay? In, especially in a reversible world. In a reversible world, you cannot reset, okay? This is, this is uh, the whole purpose of what I was uh, saying before. You cannot reset. So, so it cannot be, you cannot pump entropy, you cannot pump randomness out of the computation by, by, by applying a, a new uh, unitary computation, okay? So if you have some randomness here, that would mean that you have randomness here, but obviously here you don't have any randomness because if you ask the question, I want to measure uh, to, or to know if my state is in U0, then you find that you are always in U0 with probability one, the, the, the answer will be yes. Okay. So there is no more, no more randomness in your, in your system. So because of reversibility of quantum mechanics, there cannot be randomness here as well, okay? so. Very, very important uh, part. Uh, the Hadamard gate is, is doing something that's weird. Okay, uh, good. So, so now uh, we got the tool, uh, <laughs> but we need to, to assess how powerful the tool is. Okay? And we need to understand a little bit more about uh, the possible power of quantum computing. Okay? And now, okay, comes a, a little bit more technical part. I hope this one was not too technical already, but I'm trying to walk you, uh, you know, slowly uh, throughout the, the, the reason. Okay. Um, so this is this is the superposition. So now, what I'm going to do is just spend the next slide re-explaining exactly the same the same uh, weird stuff. Okay. But I'm trying to change a little bit the representation. Okay. So I'm changing uh, the view of the Hadamard gate. So the Hadamard gate. Now I, I want to draw it like. You know, I have a circuit and I apply gate. So I have an input, which is A, and an output, which is A, and, and this box here that does the transformation. And what I want to represent is this calculation that I did just before, uh, where, okay, I, I'm starting in U0. And then what I'm saying is that I end up with an equal weight superposition of U0 here on the output and U1. And the way I, I you know, represent it is by drawing this line from the input to the output saying, okay, if this guy is connected to this guy, then you know, the output definitely uh, contains a U0 term. And what I've been, uh, written above the, the, the line is you know, the, the coefficient, okay? which is called the MPG. Okay, so, so if I start from U0, what you read from the, the graphic here is that it ends up in U0, times one over square root two plus U one times one over square root two. So this is exactly what I wrote before on, on the previous slide. And for U one, okay, I end up with a contribution in U zero times one over square root two, and I end up with a contribution in U one, this time with a minus one over square root two, okay? This is the same, we can rewrite it in a different way, like more like a truth table. I don't know which, which representation you prefer the most, but, but it's always the same. And I can rewrite all of this uh, in an even more compact form, which is by taking uh, minus one to the, to the power a times x, okay? Where a and x are binary bar. Okay, so this is always, I mean, only saying exactly what I, I said before about the Hadamard gate, just a different transformation but it's a little bit more convenient for what I'm uh, going to explain now. So um, let, let's redo the computation that I had before. And maybe if, if people have seen uh, things about quantum mechanics before, uh, this graph uh, should remind you about what is called um, the uh, uh, double slit experiment, okay? It's exactly the same. Okay, so uh, uh, let, let me uh, re-explain my, 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 uh, my example before where, where I apply two Hadamard gates in a row. So I'm starting, I was starting in the U0 state. I can move to U1 and to, uh, sorry, to U0 and to U1 on these two, two edges here. 
Uh, that's after the first Hadamard gate. And after the second Hadamard gate, well, each of these points is, is linked uh, 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 to the output uh, with, the, with the, um, the same graph that I had here. So I can move again to U0 here, but if I am in U1, I can move also to U0. So I have two terms that end up in U0 if I start uh, from U0 and, and, and look at, at the output of the, of the two gates in a row. And each of these paths contributes with a, a factor one over square root two squared. Okay, so I have one half here, one half here. Okay. And for the other outputs, well, actually I have two, two paths to end up uh, uh, here, but one comes with two contributions that are positive contributions. So it's uh, again, one over square root two squared. And the, 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 the lower path actually is one over square root two times minus one over square root two. So these two cancel out, okay? So it's the same computation as before, just a different, more graphical representation. So in fact, here, what I want you to, to, to remember, and that's why I, I, I drew this, this connection is the double split experiment uh, that was really like one of the major uh, uh, say explanation given by, by quantum theory uh, to uh, earliest uh, 20th century, century scientists, uh, which is that, okay, you have various outcomes of measurements of, 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 of experiments, that can add up in a constructive way, but also in a destructive way, okay? And that explains why you have fringes, interference fringes in this kind of experiments. Some photons pass, add up, and reinforce the probability of being there, and some, some pass uh, for the photons actually destroy each other. Each other. And it is exactly the same thing, okay? So basically, uh, 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 here I'm just describing something with more like computer science uh, language, but which is very, very physical. So this is, this is the view of the Hadamard gate. Well, if I want to make my point, actually I, I need to look at other gates in the same way, but I'm going to be much, much faster this time. So Toffoli gate, okay, I have three input, three output, okay. So for the three inputs, I have zero, 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 or zero, zero, one, and, and so on. And it's linked to the output. And here you can see a, a fairly stark difference with uh, the Hadamard gate, the more simple uh, Hadamard gate that we, we looked at before, is that here I have only one-to-one -one correspondence. Okay, and this one-to-one -one correspondence, if you have it, you know that the, that the gate is reversible. Okay, that's what I, I, I told you before, but you, you can see it with your bare eyes here, um, and you see that all my lines are black, which I, you know, I draw black when it's uh, it's boring. It's uh, it's classical mechanics, it's, uh, it's a positive number that's uh, on this edge and it's actually one, okay? So this is, uh, uh, this is uh, what the Toffoli gate does with the transition amplitude. So it, it tells you like, if you started with a given amplitude, say on zero, 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 uh, um, you will definitely keep uh, being in zero, zero, zero. The, the, amplitude, the amplitude will not have uh, being uh, moved to another uh, combination of, of variables here. And on top of that, it was just multiplied by, by one, okay? Whereas here, if you start in one, 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 well, okay, the amplitude that you had at the entrance of the, uh, uh, at the input of the, of the gate for one, one, one will be transferred to one, one, zero, uh, but it, its value will be unchanged, okay? It's multiplied by one, okay? So the only thing that the top of the gate does is just switching these two, uh, these two uh, input and output, okay? But now I can actually define other gates and, and I need that because I want, I want a little bit more quantum. So I can define the Z gate. Z gate is very simple, one input, one output. It maps zero to zero and one to one, but for one to one, the amplitude will be multiplied by minus eight, well, by minus one, sorry. And you can write it in a compact form this way. Uh, you, can, you can go on with uh, what's called the control Z gate. So it's the same, but with one more qubit. So you have, you have four states now. Uh, and it's only for the one, one that you get a minus one, uh, the quantum contribution if you want, okay? And then you can go on with the control, control Z gate. And then that's it. I'm, I'm going to stop with U gate, but what I want you to understand is that you can represent what these, these gates, what these elementary uh, operations do and, 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 and get these nice formulas for what, what this input is and what the output is. 
Okay, but what is it good for? Okay, what power do I get from this representation? And, and more importantly, from using these gates in physical systems. Well, this is, this is uh, uh, now uh, uh, like condensed in the input. So uh, here it's, it's a simple example of what a very elementary circuit could be. Okay, so the circuit is just uh, uh, the following things. So you have three inputs. You have Hadamard gates on each of these uh, wires. You have here a, a control, control Z gate. You have a control Z gate between these two qubits. Uh, a Z gate here and again the Hadamard gates. Okay? So this is a perfectly valid uh, circuit. You can, you can file them up this way. And you can ask yourself, well, okay, now I want to recursively apply the formulas that I had before. Um, I, I'm, I'm giving the formula here just mostly for your, your, uh, uh, you know, your curiosity. And if you want to, to, to derive it, you can do it with you know, everything that I gave you. So it's, it's very simple to, uh, calculation. You just pile them up, put the, 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 the diagrams that I've uh, shown before one after the other and, and track down all these terms. And it's very easy, like it's, it's a, yeah, maybe five minute calculation. So, so you, get, you can get there and, and get to the transition amplitude for, for, uh, um, for starting with uh, something in A1, A2, A3 and, and measuring or, or getting something, the output for Y1, Y2, and Y3. Y3. Okay. So you know everything, how they translate into one another uh, and, and, and how the amplitudes are, are affected by, by coefficients and possibly negative coefficients. The interesting part here is that this generalizes a lot okay? and it generalizes in a, in a quite simple uh, way. It generalizes in this way, okay? So basically the amplitude is, is just this kind of stuff, okay? So this is again, uh, my, my, my scalar product that I was taking before. I have a normalization factor here. And, and what is important here is, is just to say, everything that you see here is minus one to the power something, okay? And basically this is a minus one to the power of a polynomial, okay? And this polynomial has a certain number of variables, okay? Uh, and uh, basically uh, you are just, when you are, computing a, a transition amplitude, uh, you are taking the sum of minus one to the power P of X and X takes all the possible values. So it's a, it's a multivariate polynomial. So you have N variables in this polynomial and it's binary variables, okay? So now the, 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 the nice part is the following, okay? It's a polynomial and it's on binary variables and, and the output is zero one, okay? Zero or one, okay? So, if it's zero, okay, minus one to the power zero is one, and minus one to the pi, uh, to the power one is minus one. Okay, so basically this expression here you can always write it in, a, in the following way, which is one over two to the n times the number of, of 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 values x for which p x is equal to zero. Okay, because minus one to p x would give you one in this case minus uh, the number of, 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 of x's for which px is equal to one, okay? And this is again, because in this case, minus one to px would be minus one. So if you count the number of these guys and you subtract it from, from, from these ones, you get exactly this expression. Okay, good. So might, you might, be saying like, is that going to last forever this way? Um, okay, so we are, we are approaching to the, to the conclusion of, of this technical part. Uh, but actually this, this, this way here of representing things and what a quantum computer does is because this is exactly what a quantum computer does, okay? It takes input states, transforms it with this rule of moving transition amplitude. Okay? So here you, you have a super generic way of representing everything that a quantum computer does. Okay, it's a very simple formula in the end. Okay, so uh, uh, here we have everything we need to 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 have to try to assess the power of quantum. So basically, the question is like, well, a quantum computer gives me these values here, and I'm I'm going to to go back, and that's actually my main point now. To tell you and describe you what what is this it gives me, but but imagine that you have access to this. Okay. So how is it? How hard is it 
to actually compute these kind of quantities, not with a quantum computer, because obviously this is what it does, but also uh, uh, with a classical computer. If we find out that computing these, com these quantities with a, 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 a classical computer is very hard, whereas uh, a computing the same with a quantum computer is much easier, then we would have understood a little bit that there is a difference between quantum and classical computation. Yeah? And this is actually the case. Um, so as I just said, yeah, these quantum computers compute transition amplitudes. I, I go back to this because we have to be super careful on what we mean by compute. Uh, uh, but, but what is interesting is, is uh, when I compare that to the classical case, okay? If I'm asking, okay, can you compute the difference between these kind of sets, okay? Like number of solutions to an equation Px equals zero minus number of solutions Px equal one. This kind of stuff is called gap, the gap of the function P. Uh, and even for very simple function, exactly the ones that I took before, so a degree three polynomial uh, over binary variables, this is hugely difficult, but huge, hugely difficult. Okay, so doing this classically is, is just terrible. Okay, gap P uh, is actually a, a, a class of problems uh, that is, uh, uh, that is uh, uh, contained in PP. Uh, PP is, is uh, well, okay, so it's a complexity classes, but maybe what you know is NP, okay? What, what people call like exponential problems, okay? So, so this gap P is harder than anything that is hard for NP, okay? So, so gap P is really like terribly hard. So we have no chance that a classical computer is, 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 is doing it, okay? Uh, okay, so, so apparently I am in a super nice and favorable situation, which is that I realize that what quantum computers do is uh, 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 computing with, uh, uh, with quotes these transition amplitudes. And what I know is that doing the same uh, uh, with a classical computer is very, very, very hard. And it, it's even, you know, I, I took the, the care of, of, you know, being paying attention because you, you might say, okay, you, gap is not exactly what you compute here. You have a, a one over two to the n factor. So you have to be careful. Okay, that's true. But, but computing gap over two to the n is also hard. So, so what I said is not, is not wrong. Okay? And apparently quantum computers do that with very few things. Whereas for classical ones, it's even worse than exponential problems. So, so we have no chance to do it. Okay, so now, now the really, really main point is, well, okay, what do we mean by compute here? Okay. Are we really done in this situation? Um, and basically, and that's why I'm sorry, I want, you know, I had to go through this technical introduction. Everything that's said here is usually condensed into uh, uh, some uh, commercial uh, description of quantum computers by saying, okay, oh, that's nice. You have superpositions in quantum mechanics and quantum computers compute all the solutions in parallel. Okay. Uh, that's true if, uh, if, if you stop here, okay? And if you say, oh, uh, quantum computers compute these values but compute it exactly and give you access to it. But this is not actually the case. Unfortunately, uh, uh, this is not the case because quantum computers don't give you the transition. They give you something that is more subtle. They give you samples drawn from this distribution, okay? Drawn from a distribution that is obtained from the, uh, from the transition. And this is much, much different, okay? This is, way more complicated because sampling is not the same as having the, the exact value, okay? Because you know, and, 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 and you do statistics, you know that there is a difference between having the, the, the precise value of a, a probability distribution and getting samples because at least you have a little bit of variance, you have a little bit of, of what physicists call shot noise, which is the statistical noise due to the fact that you only have finite samples, okay? So in fact, you don't get to the exact value. You get to an additive 
estimation of this transition amplitude. And now what you should ask is, is, not, is that hard to get exact, uh, exact value for this function for classical computers, but is that hard for classical computers to approximate this value with the same precision, the same additive precision? Okay. And, and there, the complications really begin. Okay, so I'm not going to, do, to go into this, but, but just I wanted to make this point. It's simple to say, okay, it's, uh, it's you know, it's, uh, you have exponential, uh, exponentially many solutions that you explore at the same time. Yes, but the, the quantum computer doesn't give you access to this. It gives you access to a sample, and the sample is way different than having access to exact computation. So for instance, fortunately, it's still hard to get a multiplicative approximation of this hidden gap uh, functions in the worst case. It's thought to be hard on average, but when you start uh, uh, looking at additive approximation, things get a bit more tricky, okay? It depends on the class of functions that you are looking at, okay? There are the class of functions that I have shown you before, where you have that, that come out of circuits with Hadamard, these gates in the middle and Hadamard at the end. These ones are hard multiplicative approximation, but they are easy for additive approximation. Now, if you get a universal quantum computation, so a more general circuit, it's going to remain hard also additively, okay? So you have to really think a lot and be super careful about what you're saying. That's one thing. But there is even one more thing that you should be aware of, is that these quantum computers, especially the ones that uh, uh, are in the wild now, are noisy, okay? And again, noise is making your life simpler for the classical computer, because what was hard was when we had to estimate uh, uh, the value of these transition amplitudes exactly with a, a, a classical computer. That was immensely difficult. Now, I said, well, if you go to additive approximation, then that, ca that can come, uh, become easy as well, okay? But for some, that will remain hard. But if you add noise on top of it, and if you have too much noise on top of it, then even the hard stuff there might become easy, okay? So this is a, you know, like a, a, a warning uh, a, a presentation. Don't fall necessarily in the traps of listening to what people say when they just go for, you know, a, a broad general audience, okay? Math are not so complicated, okay? It's, it's simple, simple math, math uh, simple vector space and things like this. It's better to check for yourself. Okay, it's going to take time to learn quantum mechanics and it is an effort. And, and I can't say uh, the opposite, but, but I think it's worthwhile because it's, there are places where it's tricky and, 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 and that's where you need to put together people that have knowledge of quantum information and knowledge of business because it's the business that will tell you whether you need an additive approximation, multiplicative uh, approximation, how much noise you can tolerate and everything in your, in your computation. Okay, so I'm, I'm concluding this first part and then, then I will go to, to more gentle talk. Uh, take home message from this technical part. Quantum computations and quantum computers do computations that correspond to expon exponentially many parallel computations. Okay, but with a warning, uh, because retrieving the information out of it is super tricky, okay? And this is where most of the uh, uh, intensity and thought must be put in. Uh, quantum computers will unfortunately not help in all situations, okay? Uh, when, when you take everything into account, um, basically we think that quantum computers will be able to solve hard problems, but not all of them. Okay, so in particular, we have no real good reason to think that quantum computers will be able to solve NP complete problems efficiently. Okay, so all the people that are thinking that uh, you could use a quantum computer to solve efficiently the traveling salesman problem, they are wrong. Uh, yet, 
uh, you could still use a quantum computer to explore solutions in a different way, in a very simple, uh, I mean, in, in, in a way analogous that people are still, it's not because the, the traveling salesman problem is empty complete that nobody tries to solve it. I mean, sometimes you need to solve it, right? Uh, so you know that finding the, the, the best solution might be super hard, but maybe you are happy with an approximation of this situation, of this, uh, of this solution, okay? And uh, you have classical algorithms that can do this, and there are also quantum algorithms that can do this. And maybe the quality of approximation is not the same all the time. So maybe some instances will give you better results with a quantum computer. Maybe some other instances will be better with a classical one. Okay. So that's something to, to keep in mind. Uh, yeah, what I said just before, like quantum computing algorithms need to be designed uh, almost on a case by case basis. And there is no real uh, black box, easy black box approach, at least yet. Uh, people are trying to develop this, but, but yeah, I mean, unfortunately, uh, if you really want to make it work, uh, you need to dive in. Okay, there is no shortcut for this. And uh, I'm sorry, I would like to, to, to have shortcuts, but, but uh, it would be useful for students, but, but no, unfortunately, they have to work. Uh, and um, you have to keep in mind that. Yeah, we assume the almost perfect machines without noise. Uh, there are basically two kinds of, of machines that you can think of, two kinds of models. There are like what we call fault tolerant machines that are uh, error free, okay, because they are fully error corrected uh, like this, but unfortunately we don't have them. Um, and it's still going to take quite a bit of time before people and experimentalists manage to, to, to construct and build these machines. Uh, but uh, uh, we have right now some machines that are, that are noisy. So, you know, keep in mind that if noise will be too, too, too big, then probably you can do everything fast. Okay. So that's, that's one problem. That's it. So that was it for this. Uh, um, um, I'm just checking the time. Uh, okay, so, so I, I, it's, I uh, it's okay. You, okay. you have a few minutes, perhaps, but... Uh... Uh, maybe uh, we can leave you a little more, but in any case, at 30, we have to finish yeah. so that the people can also work, not only listen, but it's it's very fascinating what you are saying. Please. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Uh, so, so okay, let, let me go to the current impacts and then uh, we'll take all the, the questions. Um, current impacts. Uh, well, okay, you might think, okay, it's very like futuristic technology and things like this. Uh, well, that's partly true, and then, and but but uh, but nonetheless, there are some some very big impact on, on, on real world. Okay, so first of all, like a few examples of algorithms using uh, uh, these large scale machines, these four torrent machines. You have the discrete logarithm. You have uh, some linear algebra. You have search. Uh, you have also um, uh, simulations of of, 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 of uh, quantum systems. So it's more like uh, towards physicists. Um, and you, you you can do a lot of things, and presumably some 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 gaps. So the advantage of using this is exponential uh, in some cases, which means that you gain an exponential factor in the numbers of operations you need to to, to, to solve the problem. Okay, discrete log is, is just basically factoring large integers, and factoring large integers means you can break. Uh, uh, crypto systems that are used for public key encryption. Uh, so uh, uh, credit cards uh, are potentially harmed by, by quantum computers. Okay? So that's, that's uh, some examples of, of, of quantum algorithms. Uh, you can use uh, quantum algorithms for these noisy machines, not error corrected. And these ones are a little bit more like in the flavor of black box. Uh, but the problem is if you want to have a little bit of guarantees of this, then, you, know, you need still to do the, the analysis by hand and, and mostly on a case by case basis. And um, they, they look a little bit like, like you know, variational uh, simulated annealing uh, and things like this in the, in the classical space. Okay, so it's called variational quantum eigensolver, quantum alternating operator ansatz. And you also have analog quantum computers, but that are more oriented towards physics uh, simulation. People use it a little bit for optimization, but uh, I would be very careful on this um, because, because the, the model being analog, uh, you have, you know, it's, it's kind of difficult to, to, to assess 
uh, how far you are from the solution. Okay. So uh, there are a few a few algorithms like this that you can try to use uh, on, on smaller scale machines and machines that exist. I mean, you can access it through the web, uh, mostly through IBM. Uh, you also have machines that are available through uh, AWS and, and 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 directly from companies. Okay, so you can you can run your small quantum algorithm. Unfortunately, and that's where you need a little bit of, of, of brain power there. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the, 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 the size of the machines uh, doesn't make that able to solve anything interesting that you can install on your laptop, basically. Uh, so it's good to play. It's good to get a little bit accustomed to it, but but it's not like getting through tutorials. Like if you really want to 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 understand what's going on, then you should try to assess um, what happens when the system size will go, when the number of qubits of your problem will be bigger. Okay, and this is a bit more complicated. So you can understand what happens on real machines with let's say 20, 30, 40 qubits. Uh, but but the question that you should ask when you do this kind of experiments is is uh, yeah, okay, uh, what kind of result did I get when when it's eighty, when it's two hundred qubits, okay? Because there you'll be possibly into a regime where the solution uh, will be interesting for your uh, for your applications, like business applications, okay? Uh, but 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 at the same time, you need to assess if the noise level is not too high already. So that in fact there are like classical solutions that will give you the, the, the same kind of thing, no, or, or, okay, or n performance. Um, so that's that's what you can get. Uh, and of course there is the quantum cryptography. Uh, okay, so there you are back in the good guys. You, you stop breaking uh, <laughs> crypto systems. You, you uh, on the contrary, try to protect information. With quantum. So an impact is mostly on quantum cryptography, on quantum cryptography because there has been a big change uh, uh, that is pushed by the NIST, so the, the standardizing both body uh, of the US to change the, all the crypto systems that are used because of the prospect of having large scale quantum computers. Okay, and I think like if if I put myself in your shoes, uh, that means that there is going to be a large increase in cyber security security risks because people will change their crypto systems uh, and uh, well you have operational issues in there like uh, when you change uh, something that is a standard that people have been using so, for so long ago then of course you have mistakes you have like misconfiguration you have whatever could happen so i'm suspecting that we'll have like a lot of, of cyber risk happening in there okay on computing well okay uh, People are, are working, I would say. It's, it's more like exploratory uh, uh, at this stage uh, because people want to pinpoint possible use cases. So there are some, uh, but as I said, like it's still a little bit like we are still a little bit in, in the middle of, 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 the, of the stuff. Like 20 years ago, we had like super nice algorithm, but we had absolutely no machine. Okay, now we start having machines. They are not very good, in the sense that you cannot solve anything really interesting. Uh, you have increased a lot the number of, of possi possible applications, but, but you, you are not quite there yet. So you can test some stuff, but on small scale, and you don't exactly know the time, at least, you know, uh, how, how useful that is to, 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 to know that you are able to solve this on, on, on small scale. Okay? People are trying also to. to Couple that with uh, HPC a little bit like like uh, like GPUs, and if I if I look into the future, uh, uh, well, um, yeah, I was saying this like you need to account for crypto uncertainty. Uh, uh, you might also want to to ensure that computations are correct, like quantum computations are correct. Uh, this is something that is a bit new because basically uh, what what you are saying is like if quantum computing is bringing you new power. Uh, how do you check that your uh, service provider providing this quantum computing facility is giving you the right results? Okay. So this is a problem. This is a question. This is actually a cryptographic question uh, that is a bit tricky <laughs> to handle, uh, but but you can do it. Okay, and uh, and uh, well, that's that's basically what we are doing in in, in the team part of the part of the team here, uh, trying to ensure that you have ways or certificates, if you want. 
uh, of good achievements in terms of integrity and privacy of your data and, and, and execution of the algorithm uh, when using quantum computers. Okay. Um, and the impact on your direct business, uh, well, it really depends on applications, but I would say, well, algebra plus optimization are quite general. So I would really be surprised that there are no spots where you know, a quantum computer uh, can help. Uh, but as I said before, unfortunately, you, 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 know, you have to dig in and to open this, this big box of, 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 of algorithms that you are using and ask yourself the question, okay, what am I doing? What's the best I could do classically? And is that still a problem uh, uh, when uh, I implement the best solution? Uh, can, would that be really making me gain more money uh, if I implement this on a quantum computer. And, and this is a very big and intense work to start, but it's also very rewarding in my opinion, because maybe you do this for answering this question like does quantum computing help? But along the way, by just doing this, you might uncover new sources of optimizations, of classical optimizations that you can apply right away on your uh, on your business and without necessarily taking the risk of buying the machines and so on and so forth. Okay, so for me this is really really uh, an important uh, important part. Um, yeah, maybe going fast on the on the when. Uh, okay, as I said, we have a few hundreds of qubits. None are corrected. There is a battle back and forth actually for uh, 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 finding good uh, good problems uh, and, and and assessing how helpful the quantum machines are, the current machines are. Okay, there is a back uh, a fight like each time quantum says, "Oh, we have something useful," then people doing classical stuff. Oh, we tweak we tweak our algorithms and we can beat you now. And then the quantum guys go back and they, they improve and so on and so forth. Uh, the problem is uh, the big uncertainty is that there are many different architectures, and some could potentially arrive faster than, than we can foresee at, at the time. Um, bottlenecks, I explained this uh, already a bit. You know, reanalyzing the full computational software stack is, is, is a pain, uh, I think, but I think it's very rewarding in the end. And it takes uh, time. Uh, so I would say, like, you know, if you think it might be useful and, and and companies have a little bit of slack in terms of, of dedicating people to, to this kind of questions, they, it's probably a good idea to, to, to start being, building a very small team dedicated to this, and that is learn uh, little by little. So what you can do, well, you can go and attend small scale hackathons to get the first feeling how it goes, uh, build small teams, I just said it, and, and, and try to, to assess where quantum can happen. And, and that would be very helpful for us too, uh, because then it gives us new problems to look at. And, and we are always uh, uh, happy when we have new problems. Okay. Uh, and, and I would say like, work with private companies. There are a few quantum uh, startups uh, that are very good and they, 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 they have all the, the good resources to do consulting, which we don't as, uh, as, uh, as research institutes. Uh, but but if you have you know identified something that you think is really requiring uh, a lot of intensity of research, then of course we are happy to to, to look at problems uh, because we like this. Okay. So uh, but but for the experience, the user experience, I would say like if it's a, a, it's more a consulting job, then go with private companies. They'll be more helpful than us uh, because we are uh, mainly motivated by publishing things in in, in journals uh, and academic journals. So that's that's the main reason. Okay, and uh, thank you.